At Incheon, the 7th Infantry Division swarms ashore to strengthen the UN foothold in the north. Thousands of enemy troops are being trapped in the southwest as the Pusan spearhead races north to join up with Incheon forces. On the way to Seoul, we took a good many prisoners, too. But they didn't come east. United Nations strength is growing in the north. Men and machines, first hundreds, then thousands, flow inland from the sea to join the attack towards Seoul. With each step, however, they meet stiffening resistance as the retreating enemy consolidates his forces. At Busan, still another nation joins the growing UN command as 1,200 men of a crack Philippine regimental combat team come ashore. And at Kimpo Air Base, south of Seoul, men of the 187th Airborne Regiment arrive from Japan to become the first paratroop unit to enter the conflict. This newly recaptured airfield has also become an advanced base for increased air attacks on the enemy's supply and escape routes. As the spearhead from Busan gathers momentum, columns of transport barrel northward against a disheartened enemy. In many towns, the entire populace turns out to shout its welcome. It was like France all over again. Couldn't understand what these people were saying either. Some places, nobody was around to say anything. It's only about 20 miles from Incheon to Seoul, paved highway all the way. But it took us a week of hard fighting to make the trip. Finally, though, our amphibious gear, crammed full of rock and American Marines, started massing up at the Han River across from Seoul. It was time to retake the city. The softening up process got underway. amphibious operation, since the Han here near its mouth is well over a mile across. The Reds who had thrown back an earlier night attack were gone, pulled out to dig in among the streets of Seoul itself. The battle for Seoul was rough. 10,000 communist troops garrisoned every building and street junction with orders to fight to the death. A great many did. The shattered city is retaken September 26. During the battle for Seoul, the trap is closing swiftly about red forces in the southwest. The day after Seoul falls, troops from the 7th and 1st Cavalry Divisions join up just south of Suwon. Two days later, in the battered Capitol building, special ceremonies are held as General MacArthur officially returns the city to Syngman Rhee, President of the Republic of Korea. Now begins a tragic homecoming for the thousands who had fled the city only three months before. Look at these people, scratching through the ashes of what used to be their homes. Wonder where they got the guts to go on. 
Phil, I guess we do the same back home at the end of the night. As life begins to take root again in Seoul, the UN advance in the eastern sector goes on. On September 30th, ROC forces reach the 38th parallel. They cross it the following day. One old guy couldn't keep it straight, who was who? Turned out to meet the ROC army with North Korean flags. The end of September finds the war back where it started. But the cost has been great. On October 6th, at a UN cemetery between Seoul and Incheon, Major General O.P. Smith, 1st Marine Division Commander, honors Marine dead. Representing the Army is Major General David Barr, 7th Division Commander. Korean troops are honored by Colonel Park and Yip, commanding the ROC 17th Regiment. The silent thanks and admiration of each commander for what his men have given is echoed by the people who owe their freedom to that willing sacrifice. Elsewhere, the conflict goes on without letter. B-29 squadrons based in Japan and on Okinawa continue their daily blasting of red industrial and transport centers in the north. For us, it was a funny situation. The commuter's war, somebody called it. You'd eat breakfast with your wife and kids, spend the day over some rail center or factory or harbor, and head back home to sleep in your own bed at night. Funny situation. In the South, refugees are becoming a major problem, with thousands of red soldiers and guerrillas in civilian clothes trying to escape to the North each refugee must be individually, time-consumingly screened. To the north, events are moving so rapidly that reinforcing units are hard-pressed to keep pace with the UN advance. On October 9th, Kaesong is taken. This surrender frees the last South Korean city held by the Reds. Then on the east coast, Wonsan. Just two days after the fall of Kaesong, Rock 3rd Division troops seized the port of Wonsan, having marched 287 miles in 20 days to get there. They met little resistance. Next, the red capital itself. On October 17th, men of the 1st Cavalry Division worked their way into the outskirts of Pyongyang. In less than 24 hours, the North Korean capital is in United Nations hands. Psychological warfare plays an important role at this stage of the fighting. Using high-powered speakers, Saiwar planes fly ahead of advancing UN troops, booming their message in Korean to the retreating enemy. Safe conduct passes prove highly effective. More than once, whole enemy companies lay down their weapons and wait for our troops to arrive. Two days after Pyongyang falls, our first combat airdrop in Korea gets underway in an attempt to cut off retreating Red forces north of Pyongyang. Incheon, the Supreme Commander personally supervises the operation. Nearly 2,000 troops making the jump. In a second wave, the heavy equipment arrives, Air Express.
transportation is pressed into service. Next day, 1,800 reinforcements jump, but the enemy has already fled northward. In the east, rock forces continue their headlong charge north from Wonsan to take Hung Nam. Meantime, a Navy task force is waiting off Wonsan.